Hello, and welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is going to be presented by Ryan Blankenship on his capture of Comet 46P. Uh, and for that, he used a static tripod. Um, I don't have much prep uh, or anything. I actually didn't get an image of the week posted this week. I apologize for that. Uh, I will next week. Um, but uh, basically, all uh, we've got tonight is Ryan's presentation, so I'm going to hand it right over to Ryan. Ryan, the camera's on you right now. There you go. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, let me pull up the slideshow here and get. This is taking longer than normal. I think it's because of the conference. So wait, bear with me. Okay. Let's try this again. Okay, do you have my slideshow up? Yes, I see it. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go through the uh, equipment I used and some of the processing to uh, not necessarily create a, a static image of the comet, but rather a slideshow showing how the stars move and the comet in relation to the stars. So um, <clears throat> first, the agenda. Uh, I want to talk about why this is for full circle for me. Uh, and then go over the static tripod and camera setup and the equipment used. And uh, that one is what pretty much anybody that has a DSLR can do. Uh, and then I'll go over uh, how I used my Edge HD uh, tracked OTA to capture some close in shots. They weren't the greatest because 2800 millimeters is just uh, too, too tight. And then I pick it back to another DSLR I have on top of that. So I'll show how I rig that up. And then we'll get into uh, basically using Lightroom and the sliders to improve the pictures and actually create the slideshow. So why this is full circle for me was back in 1997, we had the Hale-Bob Comet come across. And that was back in the 35 millimeter film days. I had a Canon 35 millimeter with a kit lens went out there used two rolls of film and these are the two images out of the whole set of uh, images I took that actually was able to uh, develop properly and that's the close in of the better of the two you can kind of see the, the small tail coming off of it and the larger tail and there is some trailing because the tripod I had was pretty pretty junky uh, but that, that got me interested that, you know, like many of us, you take that first shot and that's not of a sunset or a moon and, you know, oh, well, that is up there and we can take images of it and you don't need something like Hubble. It, it kind of hooked me, uh, but, you know, life got in the way and I had to delay until last year uh, before I could actually start doing this as a uh, more dedicated hobby. And... Then we get into what did uh, I use for the extreme wide field is what I'll call it. Um, on the left, you have the, the tripod that I actually have. It's a pretty sturdy tripod, but any tripod will work. Uh, the sturdier, the better, obviously. Uh, this particular one has a ball head and uh, makes getting things lined up and leveled or oriented uh, a lot a lot easier uh, so if you can invest in a nice uh, tripod like this one that has a ball head um, by all means do it it's well worth the investment uh, otherwise any tripod will work um, and these images are taken straight off of amazon for my order so uh, those are this is you know they're not that uh, expensive actually uh, also, I have a T7i body. Uh, it came with the kit lens, but I used a different lens. So I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but it's basically a stock uh, T7i that I purchased off of Amazon. I had a T6i, uh, which will come up later uh, previously. So a lot of the lenses I already had are interchangeable. So it worked out pretty well. So anybody with a DSLR and a tripod, uh, you can already see you're going to be able to do some of this stuff. Uh, and then the kit that I bought, uh, simply because I couldn't get a nifty 50, as they call it, uh, onto, you know, individually. Uh, they were out of stock at the time. So I ended up having to go with this kit. And it's base, it's 
It's a 50 millimeter prime lens with autofocus and it runs at f1.8. And that's the reason I wanted it because I wanted to do some of these wider field shots with it. And then on the right, we have an intervalometer. So up to this point, a lot of people already have a DSLR, a kit lens and a tripod. So that the only thing you really probably should uh, need to buy at that point is, is an intervalometer. And this one right here was $15 on Amazon. It can do 399 total exposures and you can set it up to several hours on an exposure if you wanted to. Uh, really key to be able to get those uh, repeated shots one right after the other. Uh, on the left, you got my ugly mug and the setup. This was for a uh, Star Trail video I had done on my uh, YouTube channel. So that's not the 50 millimeter lens, it's a 24 millimeter. Uh, but the the basic setup is was identical the night of the comet on December 16th of last year. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And then on the right, I use photo pills on uh, my phone. It's a wonderful little app where at the top, you can put, you know, it's got a database of all the, most of the cameras, I shouldn't say all, but most of the cameras, including the T7i I used, you can set your focal length and uh, your f-stop, and then it'll give a, uh, the how, mu how long your exposure should be. So in this case, for ex extreme pinpoint, go to 3.44 seconds, and the old 500 rule, go to six seconds, I set my stuff up for four seconds uh, to get as close to those pinpoints as possible. And that can be downloaded, that app can be downloaded from uh, the store that you use, be it uh, Google, uh, Android, or Apple. And then on the settings that I used, uh, obviously the camera has to be set to manual uh, so that you can change anything else. Your, my aperture was set to f1.8. I used the 1600 ISO, the 50 millimeter prime focal for the lens, and the exposure was set to bulb as opposed to any time duration. The bulb setting allows you to go and use the intervalometer to control the exposure length. As nice as the DSLRs are and have those features where you can set the exposure lengths up to like 30 seconds, uh, they usually jump from like 5 to 10 to 15 up to 30, and you don't get those individual second um, uh, intervals in between there. So the intervalometer uh, helps for that. And then on the intervalometer itself, uh, the one second delay is the minimum that it will allow. Uh, 399 iterations, that's the maximum, which kind of coincides with about two-thirds of the battery on the uh, camera in most cases and a four second exposure. And then, uh, so here we have the, whoops, let me go back. Uh, nope, it's not gonna let me play the slideshow, unfortunately. <clears throat> it's supposed to be a slideshow, but for some reason I'm not getting the controls. All right. Well, this is the. Are those not the, the controls on the bottom left, or is that just for the? Uh, yeah, right there. Are those them or yeah. no? just for the? No, it should have a time slider with a play button, and it's not. Let me hide this. No, not right. coming up. Uh, yeah, the hangout screws stuff up like this occasionally. I should have done it in advance. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. I can. You can try up, just uh, uh, closing and reopening the PowerPoint. See if that helps. Well, I've got it saved as a separate uh, video cool. file that I can pull up later. And it's a comp it's a compilation uh, video, so it'll have all of them in there. Uh, so as you can see with the 50 millimeter, you got Pallades down here in the middle right. And the comet was just above that. Kind of faint, but you can see it. And then the side slideshow, uh, because the, tri the tripod is static, there's no tracking. Not only will the stars move, but you'll also uh, see the comet move ever so slightly inside the field. And are there any questions at this point? 
There haven't been, but uh, I should remind everyone, if you have any questions about this presentation, type them into our chat. Uh, if you can't find our chat, go to the astroimagingchannel.com and check the bottom right, and you'll see a little bouncing box. That's where you get in, and you can ask your questions there. Okay. All right, and just to reiterate that, you know, this, this right here is what anybody can do. You know, as long as you got a camera, a tripod, and a, you know, basic equipment, uh, you can do stuff like this, and you know, a lot of times they turn out really well if you take the time to learn what you're doing and you know, get in some of those groups and uh, uh, talk to people, uh, watch some of the videos on YouTube or other sources. Uh, you know, there's great sources of information out there. So next up, we're, I want to go through uh, my normal rig that I use, which is the Edge HD 11 inch. Uh, We'll have some closer in shots here in a second. Uh, this was a kit that I bought from direct from Celestron. They were having a special, you know, save a few hundred bucks if you buy the kit. Um, obviously, it doesn't. Ha it didn't come with everything here. It was the uh, the tube, the the mount and tripod, and one weight, and all, everything else I went and added on later. Uh, to the right, we have the T6i I mentioned earlier that I sent that to Spencer's Photography and had that Astro modified. And by that, I mean I had the IR cut filter removed, the anti-aliasing filter removed, and had them put the visible light, uh, including H-alpha uh, filter, uh, onto it and then reconnect the sensor cleaning apparatus. And see and in this image you don't see the focal reducer or the new uh, motorized uh, focuser I have on there as well and on the right or excuse me the left is the Orion guide scope 60 millimeter guide scope uh, that I used to track I found in my research trying to get a good on X or excuse me off axis guider to work with these things was just uh, real tough and real time consuming so i opted to go with the on axis uh, just to save me some time and money for now and of course the the orion star shoot on the on the left or excuse me right uh, and i was in the military and i don't even know my left and right that's pretty sad um anyways that thing's been doing pretty well i do have to adjust when the moon comes back up uh my guide scope is just a little bit off the of center uh, which may be contributing to some of my tracking issues, but I'll get, I'll get that figured out. And then because I like to nice, stay nice and dry and warm, uh, this is a, a USB hub with media converter. So it's a four port hub on the top. It's AC powered. And then this white uh, spec here underneath is an RJ45 uh, cable. So there's another unit uh, similar to uh, this box on the inside that then converts it from RJ45 back to USB. So it looks like it's a hub that's connected to the laptop uh, without the cable being there. And that, that allows me to run a 150 foot cable into the house. I can stay nice, dry and warm and the gear stays nice and cold and uh, is doing its thing. And, but now we get into how did I actually capture these images? That was a learning process. Um, I used to Stellarium to control the telescope. And the first thing that we had to do was actually get uh, the comet into there because the comet is not natively in Stellarium. So unfortunately that slideshow is not gonna or that video is probably not going to show either. Um, but I can walk through that if anybody wants to see that after the presentation. It's actually pretty easy uh, if anybody doesn't know how to do that. Uh, it just took about 20 minutes of searching the internet and I found it and took less than five minutes to get the comment in there. Uh, once it was there, obviously, like any other target, we can uh, select it slew to it the problem that i had was that if you notice down here in the lower left the town that's selected is 
actually about 15 miles away from me and i did not have my exact lat long in there so when it points to a target it's a little bit off center so it took quite a few test shots of taking an image looking at the star pattern looking at stellarium trying to figure out where i was moved to another section and once i figured out what my offset was i was able to then move the you know select a star that was in the path of the comet and then wait for it to come into the frame and then uh, start getting that uh, uh, imaged. And this would be the video, uh, but that is my limited view of the sky. I have uh, several acres that are all wooded, only about half to three quarters is actually open. So I had to create myself a custom landscape, uh, go out there with a uh, angle finder and compass and basically map out the tree line and create a custom landscape so that I could better uh, determine what when targets are gonna be available, when they're gonna disappear. I have yet to have a night where I can just do one target across the sky all night long. It, it's usually a, a three target night simply because of the way things uh, appear and disappear. Oh, and this video is actually playing. Uh, so this video is, so I'm going over what I already described. I'll try to narrate because there's no sound. Uh, so this is where we, we're going to go through uh, actually adding the comment to the uh, to Stellarium. So basically, it's just showing how limited my view is. So we cl we click in the uh, configuration window icon on the left, and then or F two, and we go up to the the plugins tab, and from there we scroll down and then go into the Solar System Editor and then click on the configure button. And then on the resulting screen, we go over to the solar system tab. And we need to go down to the import orbital elements button and click that. I've never had any luck with the lists, so I always go to the online search. And if you read the second paragraph, it says the comet has to be prefixed with a C with a slash. And I didn't find any uh, reliable way of using the 46P. I had to actually type in the name, Fear 10, and I believe it is. And once it finds it, we can select it by just putting the check mark in it and then just click on the add objects at the bottom. And just close out the windows. And we, we should be able to go and search for it. Now, when I did the video, it was below the horizon, below my viewable horizon, so I had to fast forward. And there it was. So, you know, Stellarium's great, I love it. Uh, I know there's probably some better ones out there. I've seen some other ones in YouTube videos and they look great as well. Uh, but for my purposes, it works, it's free, and it is somewhat customizable, uh, but you know, if you're into this, use what you got, use what you want to use. Um, and then as you can see up at the top, the other nice customizable is that you can put in your camera information and your telescope information so that you get the nice uh, box, which came in handy when, uh, when I was trying to do find that offset that I needed. Uh, in this particular case, I would need to use this star down here uh, because that would have been my offset. Uh, the uh, comet would have been about right, right where these numbers are if I would have selected this star and started taking images. Um, I have since corrected uh, that, as you can see down in the corner. Uh, so things are doing a little bit better. Uh, I don't use this for normal imaging. I use this more for uh, like when I need to check collimation or uh, drift alignment or 
anything where I just need to point somewhere, I'll use Stellarium. Uh, usually just let SGP do its thing as far as uh, auto center and plate solve and all that good stuff. There, there was my offset, as I explained before. You can see I selected this target here, and that's where I was slewed to, and the comet was up here. And like I said, it, it took about 20 minutes to finally figure out that offset because it was a pretty weak area of the sky as far as uh, star density was concerned. So it took a little bit longer than I hoped, uh, but ultimately we ended up getting it. For guiding, I used PhD2, and as you can see, my guiding was kind of horrid that night. I did not spend the proper amount of time to uh, properly polar align. I just got it as close as I could feasibly get it, and uh, it, it it did well enough uh, for this stuff, but for an imaging session, this would not have been good enough uh, for anything over one minute exposures. And then for the image capturing, I used Backyard EOS. And this was, you can see just how close in, you can see it faintly here. This was, uh, I believe, a, this was probably a 30 second shot. Um, kind of faint, but uh, I was doing, as you can see down here, I was doing a lot of test shots and some of them just got too blown out if I went too long and just did not look right. Uh, at least to me, they didn't look right. So I ended up going with 30 seconds and about 100 exposures. And ISO 1600, uh, another nice program uh, that most of us have used in the past that have done this for a while. Uh, for those that haven't done this and are looking to get into it, uh, definitely look into it. You can get a free trial and it works with, uh, you know, in this particular case, it's EOS. So it's a Canon. They do have backyard Nikon as well, if you have a Nikon camera, uh, but they work pretty much identically. And then for the piggybacking, uh, I ordered the, uh, the mount here on the top. Uh, connects into stock screw uh, ports on to the back of the OTA. And on there, I have the T7i with a Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter uh, uh, telephoto lens. And I set it to approximately 300 millimeters for these shots. Um, this particular setup, the T7i and the uh, Sigma, I used for the last eclipse we had and worked really well. Uh, when that thing's out to 600 millimeters with the APS-C sensor on the uh, T7i, uh, it takes it to an effective 900 millimeter resolution. Uh, so that, that filled the, pretty much the whole frame, uh, you know, with a little bit of black on, on all sides. So it got in nice and close, looked really nice. I was really happy with it. So the, the original reason I bought the, the piggyback mount was the next eclipse that's coming up in a couple of years. That's gonna go from the Southern border up to Canada, across the US that is. Um, the center of totality is gonna be going uh, right over within a few miles of my parents' house in Ohio. So I was really hoping to do some testing and get this figured out uh, prior to that event and then use this, get set up the day before uh, polar align so that it'll track the sun for me and I don't have to worry about having to manually reposition uh, like I did uh, for the previous eclipse with the, with the tripod. But that's a sidebar. Uh, now, we're, now we'll get into the editing portion which you know we we kind of use editing and processing uh kind of you know similes i guess you would call them um so these particular images here are with that you see in the background here this was the piggybacked image the t7i set at 300 millimeters uh much closer in and since it was tracked the stars don't move as much 
there is a little bit of drift due to the alignment issue, but uh, you know, you, you get a better view of that blue glow. Um, you know, it, it just, it's a nicer, nice, close, closer in shot. And, uh, if the final video ever plays, we'll, uh, you'll be able to see just how, um, the 2,800 millimeters on the edge was, was just too much. And this should be a video of the processing. Let's see if it plays. Yes, it does. So I already imported all the um, uh, images into Lightroom. And then I went over to the develop, selected the first image, and I rotate it to an orientation that I like. And then at this point, uh, the first thing that has to be done, since it is a DSLR with a, with a lens, you have to do the, the profile correction. Uh, and I'll click it a few times here. Again, this is a video I'm just narrating. Uh, you can see in the corners, it flattens the field a little bit and takes away a little bit of that vignetting as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then at that point, we could either leave it like this or uh, I went in and I just played with the sliders and just try to darken the background a little bit, bring up the stars a little bit, uh, just try to make it more pleasing to my eye. Uh, you know, as much as you know, I'm not looking to sell these things or anything, it's just I want to make pretty pictures for myself, hopefully hang them on the wall, uh, maybe share them with friends. So, you know, Facebook. So it, it's more about my eye and not so much somebody else's eye. Uh, but as you can see, I like to also just when I'm playing with the sliders, go to the extremes, see what they do uh, to the image, and then try to find some place in the middle uh, that I liked. And then we go down to presence and the clarity. And a lot of these sliders, you know, they're, they've, I, I could probably spend another uh, three or four sessions if I knew more about them just going through some of these settings and what they'll do and how they compare to Photoshop, but I'm not really that great with Photoshop. So I try to stick with Lightroom as much as I can. Um, it, it seems to serve the purpose. Uh, when I am doing my astro photos uh, with, from the, the edge, I primarily just use PixInsight and I rarely go into Lightroom or Photoshop to do any touch-ups probably could do that and if I knew more about Photoshop to uh, bring some more oomph, more pop to the images. Uh, but for now, I'm happy with it. I've only been doing this stuff for, you know, since the beginning of last year. So a lot of this stuff, uh, while to some people like Adam and Alex that are on the channel here, may seem rudimentary. Uh, I wanted to give a novice perspective more so that the people that are getting into it uh, can see that with with basic stuff we can we can do a lot of a lot of good stuff and end up producing some nice images at least nice to us and nice to our family and then we can learn from the other people uh, like those here on the the channel and then all I did here uh, was just select all the images, click on the first one, control A, and then do a sync in the lower left, or excuse me, lower right. And it, uh, that applies the settings that you did to that image, all the sliders and everything to all the images across. Uh, I did pause and we should be about done here. Yep, so it did take about 20 minutes or so uh, to paste across those because we were working with uh, raw and I had some other stuff going on in the background on the laptop. Uh, but then I noticed that the one setting it doesn't apply is the, the rotation. So that, that took a minute for me here to remember that you got to click away and back and, you know, it, it, a true novice uh, experience here to, uh, get the all of them rotated. Uh, I wanted to 
export them. And then when I was going to export, that's when I noticed something wasn't right. And it was the, the orientation. So I canceled out of all those. And now you'll see me fumble through trying to select all but the first one again. So and then after I finish this, there we go. I forgot to hold the shift key, another rookie mistake. I was holding the control key instead. So uh, select the one you want, hold shift, select the last one you want. Make sure you got them all and then do your orientation. And now I could export them if I wanted to. But we can work directly with the raw photos. Uh, again, I'm going into the export just for demonstration. And we would follow the, the various uh, drop downs and options to save them as JPEGs, TIFFs, whatever. But Working with the RAW, we can go straight to a slideshow and not have to re-import them. And at that point, all you have to do is do an export. Create a, select your folder, create the file name, and hit save. I mean, that's, that's as easy as it is to create one of these slideshows. It's just import your photos, do a little editing to them, and then go into the slideshow module in Lightroom and, and export it. believe that should be coming up to the end and I'm just showing my direct restructure which isn't the greatest all oh, this was my videos uh, some of the videos I'm put, putting up for YouTube uh, yep so and I like to use descriptive uh, file names so in this particular case the focal length the camera and the name of the target and I do that, I try to do that same practice with all my uh, astro images as well. Okay. It should be it. And then you know, I'm just showing that the export is up in the upper left. And that would take quite some time. So we'll go to the next one. This should be the slideshow. Um, I'll, the first is our the T7i, so that uh, the mid-range, uh, I probably won't be able to pause it. Uh, the second will be the edge at 2,800 millimeters, and the last slideshow is the uh, the wide field nine, or excuse me, 50 millimeters. So it'll it'll go by pretty quick here. Hopefully, it plays. So you can you can see there's a little bit of tracking issue. So there's a little bit of drift in the stars, but you can see a nice uh, how the you can, you can see you can see a nice uh, path of the comet and how it how it traversed across the star field. And if if you're if you watch that that particular one there several times, you would see that the comet does move ever so slightly. Uh, it's kind of hard to kind of hard to see the first time. And of course, there's my rig again. Uh, this video was actually what I put up on Facebook, so some people wanted to see what the rig I had uh, looked like. And with that, that's the end of the presentation. Presentation. So I just want to do a shameless plug. Uh, I mentioned I'm doing a lot of this stuff from a novice perspective. Uh, when I got into this, there is a lot of information. One of the first channels I found was you guys here at the Astro Imaging channel. And I watched every video you had. And a lot of it was informative. But then you get guys on like Warren Keller and they were talking above my head, uh, which is great for the people that need it. But the people like me that were getting into it, it was a little bit much. So when I decided to actually do this, I decided to start my own channel uh, because I didn't see a lot of novice focused uh, channels out there. 
And so what I've been doing is I've just been going, anything I do, I record it. If I fail, I record it. If, when I fix it, I re, you know, it's recorded and I say how I fixed it. Uh, so that hopefully somebody can learn from my mistakes and hopefully not uh, repeat it. As you can see over here in the lower, uh, in the middle right here, episode 10, my first SGP attempt on M27, and it was a fail. Uh, I did get some data, but you know I, I had some issues as well, and I go through and describe the issues I had, and ultimately in episode 11, I describe how I actually got SGP to finally work for me. Uh, so it's just a little shameless plug for my, my channel. If anybody's interested, go ahead, go, go check it out. If not, um, you know, uh, I'm going to keep doing it regardless. Uh, and that's the, the star trail that I was doing in that one shot there. Um, you know, this was, uh, the, the night that, uh, the grandson was born. So I've nicknamed this land and sky. Uh, so with that, do we have any questions? We're at uh, 35 minutes on the presentation. Uh, yeah, so uh, great presentation, first of all, and I appreciate your uh, approach to your web uh, to your YouTube channel uh, because <clears throat> uh, a lot of people are kind of struggling to get that toehold in whether it's processing or acquisition. You know, there's a lot of things to learn before you can even consider yourself a beginner, before you can take that first image. And uh, our hobby needs as many people focusing on getting anybody who may be interested in astrophotography doing it and uh, getting up and running. Um, so uh, questions. Well, the first of all, were, you were not tracking on the comet, correct? That is correct. Tracking on the comet, I, I, I just, I could not see which point of light was the comet in my in my uh, in this star shoot the orion star shoot so i could not track on the comet which is why i had to go with the slideshow approach as opposed to uh tracking the comet and trying to capture good data on the comet and doing some type of a stacked image of the comet right okay yeah so uh that popped up in chat and of course we jump into a rabbit hole and then that rabbit hole uh, <laughs> gets bigger but um you can uh use phd guiding to track on the comet but that does limit your post processing a bit uh, or at least yeah at least it limits the type of image you're going to get out of the comet what then you're going to get is you are going to get a um if if you're uh well i shouldn't say it, it forces you to do it but you will likely be getting a stacked image of the comet over stars that might be drifting so your stars uh, might have lines through them, or you might remove them in the end, uh, but your comet is gonna have as much detail as possible. That's if you choose to, to track on the comet, um, but you're uh, exposing to show off the comet. You can't expose short enough that you won't get track, uh, tracking stars. Um, and that might work for uh, what it is, but uh, I guess it depends on the type of image you're, you're trying to take. And um, being that you were shooting all three focal lengths, um, it's, uh, I don't wanna say it limited you, cause it kind of gave you an, a great opportunity to see them at all those different focal lengths. Um, but uh, I feel that using that, uh, the, and the conversation also went to your guide scope. I feel like using that guide scope to track on the comet, particularly with what you're saying about uh, not quite being able to figure out exactly which dot is the comet, uh, maybe something you want to avoid. Uh, you you may just not want to use that feature in PhD, even though it exists. Um, it could be difficult, and otherwise you were up and running. Used uh, uh, Stellarium, I think it was, to find the comet, point at the comet. Um, trying to think, uh, Paramounts can do it very easily with the sky. With the Celestron, uh, it's a bit more difficult. Um, but yeah, any other questions or comments for Ryan uh, while we're in here? I, I kind of took that conversation and spelled it out myself, but uh, anyone else on that same? No, I I, I managed to get myself a few pictures of uh, that comet. I found it except exceptionally 
bright actually and maybe we just we're doing it on different now when were you doing yours uh when was when was your shots taken uh the static tripod shots was on december 16th the night is the night of the closest approach okay if i remember I correctly and the the tracked images were you know starfield tracked images not comet tracked uh all of okay. those were the following night december 17th okay december 17th okay yeah i was at least a month ahead of you and um i i don't remember exactly what the date was and i found the comet easy to find i found it in my binoculars i um had a group of uh college kids from our local university and uh, they all got a kick out of it sitting up there and i found it in my 15 inch dob so it was pretty bright relatively easy to find and i think i mentioned over in the chat area that um i was trying to uh i was using a 50 millimeter guide scope separate guide scope my gm8 and um and uh auto guider the what's that the orion starshoot auto guider and i don't usually use that i usually use a different system and i actually was able to track on the comet so i could i you know nail the comet found it in there well enough uh, and i didn't know i was doing that i just found a star and it just so happens that i the star that i had found was the comet so it can be done but the discussion we were having was about um tracking it with an off-axis guider and the problem with an off-axis guider is if you can see it in the off-axis guider your main imaging camera won't be seeing it so it was kind of a play on words here uh, phd works there's actually several different comet modes in phd and um the one of them it just learns the um speed of the comet and it just changes the guide stick position uh it, it guides on a star actually but it changes how it sends commands according to um how it's changing in relation to that star and as i pointed out over the, i never actually got it to work there's a third way to get it to work is you track the comet um you you just take a picture and start tracking the comet and um you use your your buttons on your on your telescope to move the comet and you just keep up with the comet and eventually um what's its name um uh phd learns how you're moving it's noticing that you keep pushing the north button and a little bit of the west button or whatever and it says okay i'll just keep doing that and then it goes back and guides on a star and it knows how to do everything it's kind of weird um but you're right um it's it's hard to guide on a comet i also wonder about um maybe i'm making something of nothing but the tracking in declination right um like uh, you're tracking really slowly so maybe it's not much different than doing a guide correction but uh in ra well all but the all but the most premium mounts tracking in ra is much better than tracking in deck right uh, uh the ra worm is like better tuned in like the premium mounts and and deck might uh they might i don't know not quite go to the same uh lengths to make the to make it so smooth because it's just not tracking in deck well um, yeah they, they, well that's true adam remember the comet is always uh the aberration is always the same direction in a comet right right so, so you don't not, have the backlash issue you don't have the backlash right but i want like i still wonder about it. i don't know maybe i'm making something of nothing but i do wonder it's not tra it's not moving that much so it's basically not a high uh, frequency move it's just a slow following it might not cause an issue uh would it cause field rotation um it would cause the field to rotate but it probably wouldn't cause rotation within the field within the well, individual field. It's kind of a moot point because your exposures aren't going to be that long. Right, right. And in the course of whatever you do with that comet um, over time, you, you've got to, you got to process it differently. Um, 
well, uh, El Mico asked, uh, you know, how do we get, how do we process a comet uh, separately and then put it back together again? And I've done that, not particularly well, I guess, but I've done it. And uh, maybe someday I'll remember how to do it. One of the things I hate about comets and solar eclipses and transits of Venus, well, Venus in particular, but Mercury also, um, is that they don't happen often enough that I can remember how to do it the next time it comes around. <laughs> and uh, that's a problem for me. That's a very good point. Yeah, I, I did see one question here from, yeah. from Ray's John. astrophotography. Um, he said, how do you install how do you install piggyback? I can only install one screw in the bottom. Uh, Ray, I had to go around the, uh, the, the outer ring of the, uh, the rear uh, panel on the edge and basically hold, hold that piggyback up over the screws until I found two screws that aligned with the two holes on the piggyback mount. And that's where I put it. And it just so happened that it, it mounted on the top of the OTA. I hope that answers your question. Um, why is that ringing a bell for me that with the ADM um, brackets, I want to say that one of them only uses one screw. I don't know if it's the top or the bottom. And this is only ringing a bell because I happen to use a, a, an eight inch edge with the ADM uh, dovetail rings. Um, and yes, uh, I don't, I, I'm assuming, I don't know, one of them only used one screw. Uh, it. Yeah, I was, I was assuming Ray was using, or trying to use the same uh, piggyback mount as I was. Yeah. So that's, that's why, that's why I described it that way. Yeah. Ray, that rang a bell for me. So I, you might be using the same one as him, but if you are using an ADM, uh, there's one of them does only use one screw. Um, it's the, okay, so let me think about this. <clears throat> For the dovetail bar, I believe, I don't know if it's the front or the rear, but uh, whichever one, the screw goes through the center instead of on either end or something like that. I, 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 I think, think the top one is the one that only uses one. I'm trying to think about it because I also have an ADM uh, dovetail bar and can't remember. I think it's the top one though that only uses one, but I might be wrong. Well, yeah. I think it's I think it's in front. There's one, and in back there's two. That's like really confusing when you get your ADM bars. Yeah. So what? Yes. Yes. So one. Yeah. Ray saying yes. Um, that's like the most confusing thing. You think you're missing a screw, and it takes you like hours and hours and hours to figure out that there's only supposed to be one screw. But uh, yeah, I knew that that rang a bell. It looks like Jeff needs to do a presentation on the Astro Imaging Channel. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jeffrey. <laughs> Admit it. Raise your hand. Hey, did you see his picture? Yes. Yes. Very nice. Yeah, so that's yeah. that's and now Miko's like asked six times already for somebody to show him how to do that. So Jeffrey, you're you've been appointed. Would you be able what to do, do something uh, like that? Would you be able to do something like that in Photoshop with layers to align everything? And then isn't there a module in Photoshop to stack off that alignment? Deep Sky Stacker will actually do a comment alignment if you don't want to try. Well, the one in PixInsight is a lot easier to use because you only have to tell it where the comment is in the first frame and the last frame, and then it interpolates all the other ones and figures it out for you. Uh, Deep Sky Stacker, if you don't have PixInsight, will also align on the comment. And it'll actually, you can have it do two iterations where it aligns once on the comet, once on the stars, and then puts the two images together for you. The only caveat is you have to select the comet core in every single frame, which if you have lots of frames can be really tedious. But that process does exist in DSS. And while you still will kind of get the little ghost star trails, which I got when I tried to do comet processing in PixInsight as well, and couldn't quite get them out with choosing better projection algorithms. Um, the one in DSS actually got kept those star trail, those ghost star trails pretty low, and I got a pretty reasonable result the first time I tried stacking a comet in DSS. It's a little more tedious than PixInsight, but uh, it, it is available and works fairly well. 
Yeah, I always liked Deep Sky Stacker for comment processing. I, I actually have not used PixInsight for comment processing, or at least I don't remember using it. Uh, well, we still need a presentation on it. Let's see what we I can really do. Um, we should I'm also not... mention my uh, cheat method on the stars, where uh, where you you guide and image the comet on one night, and then you wait yeah. till your comet gets out of the way, and then you should send part of the sky without the comet. Mm -hmm. Particularly, oh <laughs> particularly when it's passing nice deep sky objects. Right. Um, Tony, yeah, like what, Pleiades and yeah, California Nebula and stuff like that, you know, just yeah. you shoot them separately, and then you combine the two. Yeah, and then Tony people Cook. yell at you for cheating. Tony Cook posts on Astrobin, and that's always been his specialty. He has some amazing uh, comets passing through, uh, passing in front of or between deep sky objects. Eth ethically, do you have to have them like, you know, like the comet really did pass through the California Nebula, and you just took them separately? Mm -hmm. Ethically, it I think that would have to go. It took so down like ten thousand years. Ethically, that would have to go. As in, I'm sorry, Alex. I, I didn't catch you. Is that not ethical? You said. No, no. Well, I was just thinking. No, I mean, if you if it's art, it's art. But if it's astro imaging, is astro imaging art, or does it have to be? Okay, if I take a picture of um, Wharton and going through the California Nebula, that's fine. And the next day, I come back and take a picture of the California Nebula, I would say, yeah, I could put those together, that's fine. But let's say it never went through the California Nebula. I just like the California Nebula, and I like the comet, so I put them together. Ah, that's, oh, that's different. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that, that's, that's, not what what that's not what I'm saying to do. No, no, okay. But I'm asking that. So, so the guy we're talking about actually took a picture one night of it passing through. Hmm. Uh, the field, and then the next night went back and, and got the field. Right, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, okay. Right, no, I, I don't see if there's anything wrong with that. Have we answered Elmiko's question as to how it's done? <laughs> Not yet. We'll work on that. I could probably get a comment processor on. Um, I think I think we had one on. I'm gonna look back and see. Uh, if so, Elmiko, I will just post a link to it next week, but I'm still gonna try and find uh, someone to do some processing because we could always have someone repeat something and I actually have someone in mind that hopefully he'll respond to me we'll see you know we got another question out there uh, color one shot color um, I forget where it is here Ray who was it uh, somebody asked about the if you can do this with one shot color yeah I think that you pretty much have to do comments moving through the stars with one shot color I may be wrong but uh, when I did my Wharton in a while back. I did it with a, uh, I don't remember, one of my Canon color cameras, one of my DSLRs. Um, it, so. it would be pretty difficult to switch filters and. Yeah. yeah in and theory, were, if, like if you had an electronic filter wheel and you were taking relatively short exposures, you could just rotate the filter wheel every, like, so do luminance, red, green, blue, back to back or just red green blue and then make aesthetic luminance back to back to back and if you took short enough exposures it could work but it sounds like a pain in the butt <laughs> right i wouldn't want to do it yeah and then if you if uh you get uh airplanes or something going through a, just a few subs uh, and a few channels then you're gonna have to throw out the entire rgb for that Split uh, projection algorithm, algorithms are pretty good these days. I never throw out satellite or or even airplane images, unless I only have very few exposures and the projection's not going to work well enough. Yeah. But yeah, I almost never throw out satellite or airplane yeah. images. I don't know though; it's it'd be tough, it'd be limiting. Yeah, one shot color is definitely the way to image comments. Yeah. Um. I just saw a question. Okay, next. Anyone know when the next bright comet will be around? Um, what's the website? Uh, I think that was just asked in cloudy nights, and the answer was no. <laughs> Might be on space weather. It's hard to predict those things a lot of the time. Well, they they say when's the next bright comet. You never know exactly how bright they're going to get. 
uh, but you can see when the next comet is and then hope there's some sort of uh, activity or something that uh, makes it brighten. You can always check out dso-browser.com and yeah. look at the magnitudes. Yeah. But all that tells you is that they expect a comet to come by. If somebody's asking, hey, when's the next Yakutaki coming through or when's the next whatever? No, those those by nature surprise us. You know, the uh, last time that uh, member Lovejoy that came by about four years ago, I did yeah. it. I did it exactly the way the way Molly just described it. Red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue. Yeah. It worked fine. It just took me a full day to process it in Photoshop. Yeah. John uh, just asked, is green the national natural color for the comet? And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was more bluish uh, naturally than anything else. Uh, aqua is um, is the color I described. There's a yeah, uh, not green, but bluish greenish is. Yeah, to my eye, it was blue, but yeah. to each each person their own. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, I, I see some comments on airplanes. Basically, you get an airplane or you get a bunch of satellite trails, then just shoot a few more subs and let the, re the rejection algorithm in the uh, stacking program handle it. Um, just basically average them out. Uh, if they don't average out of 12 subs, take 16 or 18 and you should be safe. Um, yeah, for me, it also depends on what's the length of the sub. If it's a one or two minute sub, something I can easily replicate the next night. I'll just junk the sub and try to get something better. Um, if it's a five minute or longer sub, yeah, average it out. Yep. That's the way I approach it. Ooh, Elias has a nice video posted in chat. Um, comet flying through the air. Awesome. Well, uh, Ryan, thank you for presenting. Um, next week, I believe David Alt is going to be on to present on some uh, slightly more advanced, uh, well, for us, slightly more advanced. For David, probably more basic tools or, uh, uh, what should I say, equations to use in pixel math and pix insight. Uh, but as you all know, David really knows his stuff and is probably one of the best people to learn from on this channel. Uh, particularly in Pix Insight because he knows it in and out. And um, Pixel Math itself is just a really useful tool for all those people who uh, can't give up some of those uh, blending modes <clears throat> in Photoshop. Uh, and that's why you can't go to Pixel Math, or excuse me, to Pix Insight. Uh, well, Pixel Math may be the way you get those or accomplish those blending modes in Pix Insight. Uh, so it's definitely going to be a good one to watch. Um, that uh, That's one that I am really looking forward to, so uh, I definitely suggest it. Uh, but again, thank you, Ryan, for a great presentation and uh, showing off some uh, great... Yeah, Adam, Adam, yes. can we remind people that we do need more presenters? And yes. um, there, we need presenters at all levels. We need the, the people that are really into math and can explain some of that. And even if we don't all understand it, I don't understand it sometimes, but lots of times. And even we know that it's out there and that it may answer some of the questions and we can research it more. But we also need a lot of people to tell us a lot of really basic stuff because our audience, there's a lot of people that really, you know, they really are asking really simple stuff. I, I occasionally get emails from people asking me to clarify something or another and they really there's some really basic stuff that, that we're just not we're just not meeting and that's maybe because we need more different presenters so please get in touch with adam well if anybody hits me up on my channel on anything that i've uh posted there that uh they'd like to see a uh 
uh, a presentation on, you know, more in depth slideshow type of presentation, I'll be more than happy to put something together. Okay. And I also want to mention, uh, guys, uh, NIAC is coming up April 4th, April 5th. It's uh, two days before NIF. So it's Thursday and Friday is NIAC, and then Saturday and Sunday is NIF, uh, April 4th. So just wanted to give them a little plug. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Tolga. Uh, and thanks, Alex. Yep, always looking for people. Contact us. Uh, you know, we. We all went through this hobby differently, learned this hobby differently, and we all probably had different struggles that stood out in our mind. And maybe someone has that same struggle that you had, and uh, you can help them work through it. Um, is NIAC worthwhile for novices? I would say it is. Uh, you might want to look at the lineup and see who's there, but um, um, I would say it is. In fact, uh, some of the more advanced people, you know, uh, they tend to say the same stuff over and over and over again. I think novices might actually be able to absorb a bit more new information there. Uh, so yeah, that's my opinion. And told us true too. It looks like um, um, there are workshops. So after right. you know during the day there are presentations, people talk, but then at night, well, I shouldn't say at night. After the presentations, in the afternoon towards the night, there are workshops where you can sit in a classroom. They'll and some of the presenters will, like for instance, Adam Block's going to be there. Uh, Adam Adam Block is going to do a uh, workshop, so you could sit in the classroom with your own computer and follow one on one. You know, doing a so it's absolutely for beginners or any. Uh, one of the other things that you've got to remember when you go to these things, um, and I'm I'm. I'm I go to lots of these things, is just sitting around and talking to the other guys and the women, the people sitting next to you um, about the problems they're having. And you go, oh, that's what you got to do. OK, I hadn't even thought of that. And these are just people you get to know. And you write emails back and forth to them through the years. And uh, amazing things happen. Yeah, I agree. Definitely worth it. Uh, whether even just to learn or just to have fun chatting with people about astronomy. Um, but thank you all for coming. Uh, like I said, next week, David Alt. Uh, one more thank you um, to Ryan, and uh, maybe we'll have him back for another presentation. Um, thanks, guys. Have a good night. See you next week. Good night.